My name's Samuel Boone and I'm the manager of Signet Reading Services and this is a short training course talking about the use of ultrasound scanning to enhance carcass traits within our sheep breeding programs. Why do we use ultrasound? Well it's a really good way of getting underneath the skin to actually look at the carcass conformation of sheep. We spend lots of time handling lambs uh, and particularly when you watch lambs being handled in the show ring the judge is desperately trying to work out how much muscle is there but also there's a fair amount of fat um, particularly with show sheep where ultrasound gets right through that and will tell you about both muscling and fatness within the carcass. Um, it isn't a measure of total muscle yield to do that you need to kill the animal and dissect it or send it up to the CT scanner uh, to look at total yield of muscle in the carcass. However it is a quick cheap repeatable and accurate way to assess muscling at a specific point in the live animal and we also know that that provides a reasonable prediction uh, of uh, total muscling uh, we know there's a relationship between those two attributes. In the early days of ultrasound scanning and here's a photo from the early days when the ultrasound scanners were relatively new and it doesn't look like we had much handling equipment either back then. Uh, then the interest was about producing sheep that were leaner uh, and as we increased growth rate avoiding a rise in, in fatness. But actually that's less of an issue with modern terminal sires and nowadays the breeder's main interest is actually increasing muscling across the loin and the overall yield of muscle within the carcass. So this presentation is going to talk about how does ultrasound work, uh, how do we go about scanning sheep, how do we make appointments and stay safe and then just a little bit about the importance of scanning within breeding programs for when you're talking to clients. So how does ultrasound work? Here you've got an ultrasound machine uh, and sitting alongside it is a laptop. Signet often take a laptop out so that the information can be directly uh, loaded onto a, a database uh, to go into our evaluations. So what is ultrasound? Ultrasound is a form of acoustic energy uh, which is characterised by sound waves. These waves can be propagated whether it's through solids or liquids or gases and the density of the medium through which ultrasound passes uh, as that increases then so does the velocity so the speed at which the waves travel and this variation in the velocity through different mediums is the thing that enables technicians to draw a conclusion about what is actually underneath uh, the skin of the tissues being measured. So in an ultrasound scanner uh, the transducer that we use converts a uh, current into sound waves and in this case you often hear us talking about the crystals in the scanning head so the crystals are expanding and contracting these vibrations um, are consistent with the frequency of the, the voltage that's being applied and the, the modern ultrasound equipment is basically using a pulse and echo principle uh, with each crystal uh, both uh, transmitting and receiving information about the ultrasound. Now acoustic impedance uh, is a function of the velocity of the sound in the medium and the density of that material. So the impedance is influence is the degree to which the ultrasound waves are reflected when uh, the interface between materials uh, changes and it's actually the reflection that we're interested in, it's the reflected ultrasound waves which are interpreted by the equipment and that are important when we're using ultrasound. We'll, uh, we'll see an example of that uh, in a moment. So actually that the um, interface between fat and muscle, the, re the reflection index is relatively small but actually the connective tissue between them provides much greater reflection and it's actually that, that that we tend to pick up with our ultrasound scanners. That probably makes more sense if you actually look at an ultrasound image. So here we can see the ultrasound bouncing back off various different layers of either fat or muscle uh, and where that bounce is arising we can actually see that on our screen. So 
Leaving the science to one side, the important bits that we need to remember is that it's the bounce back that we're looking for on the ultrasound scanner and also the ultrasound needs a medium to pass through. So air is an issue and that's why we need to use a, a good layer of liquid paraffin between the ultrasound scanning probe uh, and the skin of the sheep. So those are the technical bits. How do we actually go about scanning sheep? So the scanning site that we use on sheep will vary from country to country. The important bit is that we have a consistent place that we always go to because the shape of the muscle changes as you move up and down the spine. So uh, for signet scanning in the UK, we will be looking at the third lumbar vertebrae um, behind. So going three vertebrae back from the last rib and you can see that on the, the diagram. This is just a quite a nice slide that we've borrowed uh, to show that actually the muscle shape does change as you move down the, up and down the spine. So it is important that we're consistently measuring um, at the same point each time. And the third lumbar vertebrae is a really nice point to uniformly find uh, when you've got the live lamb in front of you. So to find it, uh, feel down to get the last rib as you move down the backbone and then use your fingers to find the next three vertebrae which are roughly a finger width apart so technicians will tend to stick three fingers behind the last rib uh, and then feeling for both spinous and transverse processes on the lumbar they, they find their scanning point it is something that's probably easier if it's shown to you uh, than uh, explained via a powerpoint we use this point because it's easy to find, it's repeatable, and we know it's a good predictor of total muscling. So the signet scanning technique, the important bit is that the animal is in a relaxed, natural position. It's not leaping about, pulling or straining, which can distort the shape of the muscle. It's standing with all four legs on the ground. Um, you're gonna split the wool, uh, uh, often using a, a sort of a blunt, pencil type shape uh, to, to split the wool and then using a little bit of liquid paraffin and there's various different containers both purchased and homemade that do quite a good job of, of pouring that um, into the gap between the wool. Be careful not to put too much pressure from the probe onto the muscle as you desperately try to get a really good image because that will change and distort the shape of the muscle if you apply too much pressure particularly the muscle less so the fat. And some of the ultrasound scanners will also come with a, a, a foot switch. So you can actually freeze the image um, without taking your hands off the sheep, because uh, really you need three hands for this job on some occasions. So that's how we settle the sheep and we take our image. It's important to point out that you are using the proper recognized liquid paraffin. Uh, the sheep here on the left, have been scanned using the sort of the vegetable oil that they'll often use for scanning cattle. Um, but with sheep that leaves a horrible mess on the fleece and that's the last thing that we want. Uh, the image in the middle is the exactly the correct liquid paraffin that's been used, but maybe we've used a little bit much because it's prevented the bloom dip being picked up in this, this prize Charolais ram. So much as we see that as a mark of um, uh, superiority that it's been ultrasound scanned doesn't really help the aesthetics and it's something that you just need to be mindful of uh, when doing pedigree sheep that are going to be bloom dipped and it goes without saying never use normal paraffin that will burn the skin and cause all sorts of problems so um, it's quite important they're using the, the right um, medium that's both in terms of uh, being appropriate for use on the sheep but also for the equipment, if you're using the wrong uh, material, then you're going to damage the scanning head and those are uh, costing thousands of pounds. So again, that's another reason to be very careful in, in what you're actually using. So we talked about the scanning technique, you're parting the wool, you're applying the liquid paraffin at the third lumbar vertebrae and you're at 90 degrees to the backbone uh, with your uh, scanning head. You'll then adjust the transducer slightly until you get a nice clear image. So just moving slightly backwards or forwards until you get a lovely crisp image. And then you'll 
freeze that image on the scanning machine. We take a single measurement of muscle depth at the deepest point and then we'll take three measurements of fat depth at roughly one centimetre intervals as you move away from the spine and typically you'll see um, the, the, the fat measurements getting thicker as you move away from the spine. Here's a nice image that uh, I, I've borrowed from the Journal of Animal Science. You can see a, a cut taken through the loin here and uh, this shows I guess the deepest point that we'd be measuring. This quite nicely shows the sort of secondary layers of fat that are starting to be laid down and the importance of picking up both of those layers and uh, also quite nicely shows the way that the muscle will also fall over the, the edge of the bone and people often ask about why do we not measure area and, and part of that reason is the challenge of picking up the boundaries uh, beyond the edge of the, 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 the bone itself and uh, that can be seen quite nicely within this picture. So you've got your image I guess how to get it wrong well the first thing is it's really important to get the right angle um, of uh, the muscle depth if you start to move and go onto the diagonal you very quickly get a much deeper measurement um, in the short term you might have one or two happy clients if you do that but it isn't an accurate and repeatable measure it isn't going to help arguably if you do that consistently it doesn't matter in a blup analysis but we want people measuring these animals in an accurate and repeatable way and it's even easier to get the wrong angle if you've just started to move your scanning head uh, round towards the side the flank of the animal then you've actually picking up a different image and it's harder then to spot uh, where you where you should be measuring in terms of right angles to the backbone so really important to get that depth at the right angle so this is a good image uh, of the third lumbar vertebrae. You can see the skin layer here. You can see the muscle sheep being picked up and you can see what the technicians refer to the sort of the rail track um, showing you directly over the, the vertebrae. So you can see um, sort of repeated lines uh, of reflection there showing that you've, you've got a real nice clear image at the right point. Um, here we're placing the cursors, we're being very careful to place the top cursor avoiding the skin layer, we don't want to be picking up the skin within this and we want to go from the top boundary to the top boundary, so the top of the fat to the top of the lower fat boundary, not measuring from the top of one boundary to the bottom of the others. Uh, and it's fair to say that the boundaries are always a lot easier to see on a moving image than they will be on a still one so you'll, you'll have that in your mind's eye. So these are the first measurements going through, these would be the second and these would be the third so taking uh, the fat depth measurements in three places there. People often say well the, the white bits in between is, is that intramuscular fat we're looking at and always a cause of great excitement. I think it's very hard to say that it is. Uh, the white flecking, the degree of flecking is obviously going to be influenced by the gain settings on the machine that will have quite a big impact on how much white and black you see but really particularly within these lean lambs it's much more likely uh, that, that you're seeing the reflectance between boundaries of the bundles of the muscle fibres and the connective tissue than actually truly picking up intramuscular fat. We can measure intramuscular fat in sheep, we do it with the CT scanner. CT scanner is essentially measuring density of muscling within the loin and the CT scanner um, uses that density as a proxy trait for intramuscular fat so that's the machine that you want if you want to be assessing intramuscular fat in sheep I would argue at this present moment in time couple more nice scanning images here really good well-defined fat layers you can have a look at you can see where the positions are on the cursor and you can have a look at those uh, a bit more in, in due course okay let's have a look at a couple of poorer images for the moment so this is one where the probe isn't at right angles to the spine it, it's got twisted uh, when it's been applied and so actually you're losing some of that definition um, as you, you move away from the vertebrae so you just need to twist the uh, probe slightly to get a better clear
clear image across the whole of the bottom uh, of that muscle. Now here's an example where uh, the probe has actually moved down the flank of the sheep so it needs to be closer to the spine uh, and it needs to be more vertical uh, on the measurement so you can see here uh, clearly that um, it, it isn't as level uh, as it should be with, with the rest of the sheep and again that's going to distort the shape of the image that you have in front of you. And here's a classic uh, image where actually you, you've got a bit of a problem with splitting the wool. So there's a bit of wool, it's influencing the contact uh, or maybe a lack of oil between uh, the, the, the probe and, and the skin and, and hence you get this, this blackout where you can't see the image. So take the probe off, uh, re-split the wool, a little bit more oil and uh, bang you'll get your image back again. Uh, Here's just a couple of images showing the challenge of scanning on the wrong vertebrae. So um, all three of them are nice images and it shows it's actually quite hard just from these images to see if you're in the wrong place. The second lumbar tends to be a little rounder, a little fuller. Uh, by the time you get to the fourth lumbar then it's tending to be a bit shallower and, and more elongated but the differences are relatively small. I think you'd be hard pressed to pick that up from the image itself. And so it's important to keep feeling where you're measuring on the sheep and making sure that you stay on the third lumbar vertebrae. So what can make a bad image, a measurement, and, and how can we avoid that? Uh, so scanning at the wrong location and to avoid that then keep uh, feeling and making sure that you're at the third lumbar vertebrae. Measuring at the wrong angle and on that basis both check the image you've got on the screen and also the angle of the scanner head of the probe on the sheep itself. Failing to pick up the right layers or including the skin, I've seen that done in the past and again if you're unclear then chat to an expert about where those um, images should be taken. You can often save a picture of the image either on your phone or on the machine itself so take a few of those, send those off to an experienced technician and just check that they would be placing the cursors in exactly the same place that you would. Um, failure to pick up a secondary fat layer can be quite common in, in the fatter sheep. Uh, you might get a lovely image of uh, the boundary between the first fat layer but then on closer inspection you can see that a secondary layer of fat is starting to be laid down and that mustn't be measured as muscle. You must pick up uh, all of that fat which might only be present in the third set of measurements that you place down. Um, it's fair to say that it's difficult when you've got very lean sheep in front of you, so either very young lean lambs or maybe you've got the option to, to wait and do those later when they're heavier and uh, there's more fat laid down. Obviously with hill lambs they can sometimes be quite lean as well and it's just the reality that they will be smaller measurements. That's a challenge for the analyses because it isn't picking up much variation in the flock if everything has let's say one and a bit mils of fat. Uh, poor image clarity, well then you need to think about resplitting the wool, applying some oil or maybe you, it's swimming in oil you need to take a bit of uh, the oil off with a bit of rag. Um, Clipped sheep can be an issue with the modern machines that, that we're using from uh, VET Image Solutions. It tends to be less of an issue, I have to say, if they're freshly clipped or if they've got lots of wool. If they've got a small amount of regrowth, a bit like uh, a bit of stubble, then that is a, a bigger challenge. So consider having a fiddle with the gain uh, to see if you can get a better image and chat to the farmers about when they're thinking of clipping sheep to avoid that. And because moving sheep are an image, uh, it, sorry, uh, an issue. So if they're coughing or stretching or jumping about, then it influences the shape of the muscles. So just take your time and wait until they're relaxed to get a true reading. Um, I ought to just mention gain settings and calibration. So yes, on the machines themselves, you can influence the, the settings and you can get them professionally calibrated which is, is probably a good thing to do um, periodically but the other thing to do is to calibrate them with other machines that you happen to have on the holding so if we do an accreditation test 
we'll do a very quick check to make sure that all the machines are measuring to the same standard and that the probes are getting a similar quality of image. So calibration and gain settings are obviously an important part of getting a good measurement and machines will vary uh, in terms of those settings. A few slides about making appointments and keeping safe when you're out and about on farm. The important thing is that you do look after yourself. Um, you'll often be out on farms on your own, so you have to be quite self-reliant. Make sure, particularly for Signet staff, that you're taking any files with you. Uh, the Signet staff will tend to take lists of lambs, electronic lists with them to load into their laptops, so make sure they're sent to you in good time. Uh, obviously, charge up the mobile phone and the laptop uh, for Scanning in the UK need at least three different sets of clothes probably um, for the various different conditions that will be thrown at you. So certainly wet weather gear, cold weather gear, uh, plenty of food, stay hydrated and sun protection is also important. Take full client details with you and also thinking about loan working best practice. So does anybody know where you're going? Does anybody know what time you're going to be back? Uh, and make sure you've got safeguards in place. One of the big challenges with scanning sheep is the long distances that are being driven. Be mindful of that, particularly after you've been scanning for five or six hours out on farm and use hotels to break up the journey if the need arises. From a health and safety point of view, there are plenty of challenges out there when scanning on farm. I guess the greatest concern is protecting your back. You'll often be leaning over, bending, stretching, picking up quite heavy equipment to put it in and out of the car, as well as picking up and moving sheep. So be mindful of your back. Uh, be careful where you place leads to avoid trips and slips. You've got animals that are moving around you. You've often got vehicles that are moving about on a farm and there's plenty of traveling uh, on the road to and from the, the um, farm. Be mindful of any chemicals that are being used. Sheep will often have porons, uh, and so if they've recently had a poron, I would strongly suggest using gloves. I realise they're a pain to work in, but very thin latex gloves might well provide some protection between you and uh, the porons that are being used. And obviously, if the farmer's deciding to use poron that day, then you can politely request that you scan the sheep first and then he sprays them afterwards, not the other way around. Disinfectants are used on the equipment and again gloves should be worn when mixing those up and washing down equipment afterwards. There are a couple of zoonoses to be aware of, so diseases that can affect humans. The first thing is if we've got ladies that are scanning that may uh, be pregnant, then there are a number of sheep infections that can cause abortion and those are extremely serious so there are particular recommendations for women of childbearing age or who might be pregnant as to uh, the ways that they actually work on sheep farms. Other things such as ORF would also be a consideration and again gloves may be an assistance there as well as being very clean, to, uh, careful to wash and clean hands before eating on farms. In terms of the setup for the day, when you're ringing through, um, have a chat about the facilities. Really, you want to be undercover and really you want to be using mains electricity. I would still do uh, use a, a circuit breaker and I'd still do an electrical safety check on the electrics that are actually there on farm to make sure that they're safe. Um, you're going to need water for washing down as well. Some farms would like you to operate off a generator. If you do that, you must use a surge protector. You've got um, you know, £10,000 worth of scanning equipment. Uh, and the last thing you want is to, is to um, have a problem and uh, cause that to explode. You've also got sheep uh, running about. So make sure that they're not in a position to knock over the equipment and make sure they're not in a position to chew through any electrical leads. Uh, that's both when you're with them and also when you disappear off for a cup of coffee or go and grab your lunch, that the equipment is a long way away from sheep. And uh, yeah, just a reminder to protect your back. You can see in this image here that uh, they're making use of an extra table and uh, taking a fold up table with you is probably a very good idea as well. You can see in this 
image here, they've separated the males and females into two separate groups. That could also make things go a little bit faster when you're out on farm. In terms of the information to be recorded on farm, you will want to record the animal's ID, uh, check its sex while you're there, or get the person that's actually weighing them to lift the tail and check the sex of the animals. It's probably the last opportunity that you've got to make sure that they are male or female um, as recorded on the lambing. And it's very easy to get a set of male and female twins the wrong way around. In terms of the scales, I would suggest that you just quickly make sure that they are calibrated. If there's a 25 kilo sack of feed around the corner, just get someone to throw that on and make sure it's weighing 25 kilos. If you get some very high measurements coming through, then uh, just lean over and check uh, that those are accurate and correct and be seen to check because all of the breeders want you to be validating not just their measurements, but other people's. So please do check the weights when you're out on farms. That is one of your jobs. And don't just trust them because they're electronic or lovely and shiny. Um, you know, it's equally important with electronic scales to make sure that, particularly that it's weighing the right sheep, that it's not picking up the EID for the, uh, the lamb behind the crush that's leaning over the top, that it is actually weighing the animal that's in the crush in front of you. That's very obvious if you've got ewes and lambs running together. Uh, where it suddenly picks up a U tag and there's a lamb in the crush. So just a bit of thought is important. We need the date of measure. We need the uh, muscle depth and the measurements of fat. And the other thing that we need is the management group. So we can record lambs separately if they've been reared in different management groups. And it's very common to have a show team and then a more commercially run group of lambs. It's not uncommon to have a group of orphan lambs that have been reared artificially. It's not uncommon to have one group that's been in a field that's just had a lot, lot more grass than the other group. And as long as we know about those management groups, we can deal with it and we can take that into account within our analyses. So ask the farm, even if it seems obvious to you that they're all one group, always ask about management groups. And for those of you that are taking files with you, with the lambs that are already on file, then obviously make a note of any that are not on file, any sex changes and anything that uh, is a different breed when it arrives in front of you is quite important to note. Scanning speed, uh, how fast should we expect our technicians to, to scan? Uh, depends a little bit on flock size. Obviously with a big flock, uh, you're gonna want to get a fairly steady pace in order to, to get home. I think the important thing to say is that for new technicians, it's better to be slower and accurate and right than fast. I've never had people complaining to me about slow technicians where they've been doing a good job and getting the measurements right. People have had concerns if you've got very fast technicians. It's the perception of inaccuracy, and particularly if, if there's a perception that the lambs haven't been able to settle and stand correctly. Um, then uh, you do need just to give the lambs time to do that. Having said that, I, I fully understand that very often the first image that you get just as soon as you put that probe onto the sheep is very often the best one. It's a lovely clear image um, and, and uh, you know sometimes you can actually get the image very fast uh, in the background. Realistically you should be doing 40-50 lambs an hour with a good setup. If you're using a conveyor then the experienced scanners are going to be doing 80 or 90 lambs. They get very excited if they, they hit 100. Um, but to do that, they need everybody else uh, working with them, reading out ear numbers and weights um, and to, to get them to flow. So 40, 50 lambs an hour would be a good target um, if you're just using a standard scanning crate. Scanning in a conveyor is a, a relatively recent um, procedure. Um, and we've been doing this for a few years now, and it does make life easier in a number of ways. Um, we should be aware that it can change the muscle shape just very slightly, but from the work we've done, the ranking of sheep is absolutely the same. So the deepest muscle is the deepest muscle, the worst muscle is the worst muscle. Uh, and I'm quite comfortable and quite confident with the measurements that we're actually taking. The advantage is obviously the speed. And in fact, with a longer conveyor, you can have the lamb you're measuring and the next one there waiting, ready to go. So two lambs in the conveyor at once makes a very efficient scanning day. 
It also helps the back of the technician because it raises the height of the animals being scanned and I'm told it's quite useful for horned sheep in particular. Um, they're not wrestling going through the crate. So that, that's some of the advantages. can be a bit of a challenge if there's either very small or very large lambs or I suspect if you've got a very variable group of lambs uh, where you're trying to get the setting right um, and you just have to be a bit wary of the l small ones sitting a bit lower in the conveyor. Um, the angle that the lamb sits then becomes really, really important. And I know my technicians will spend a bit of time positioning the sheep, making sure that it's at the angle that they want it, not just the first uh, point that it, it's landed in in the conveyor and they'll spend a bit of time positioning it. The other thing is they are an absolute pain to wash. It's about the only job I'm qualified for is washing the conveyor and uh, obviously you've got water and electrics together so you need to have the thing completely unplugged um, but you don't want too much water in the electrics and you want to be really careful washing it down. I suppose the other thing I should have put on here is the weight of the conveyor lifting it into a van or on the back of a trailer. Again, you need enough people about um, or a pulley system to actually help you to do that. So uh, great for the large flocks, uh, a nice uh, tool to have. But do take care and take care when lifting it in and out and take care with the water and the electrics. Biosecurity. Biosecurity is absolutely vital and I have to say the technicians that I've worked with have a really good reputation for this. So they do it uh, and they're seen to do it. So take a completely clean set of overalls, completely clean set of boots, bucket and brush um, and if you're doing two farms in one day then you need a complete set of uh, clothes to change between the two. We're tending to use Vercon and FAM30. Um, as our disinfectants and FAM30 has got a detergent uh, action associated with it as well and we've put the ratios up here that you need to be mixing it up with. Mix it up carefully, you need to be using gloves, you need to be protecting your eyes and obviously when you're finished with it you need to be responsible in where you get rid of it so being wary of drains and watercourses I would always ask the farm where can I tip this disinfectant uh, so that they know where it's gone and so that you're not leaving patches on their grass uh, of grass that's died off. These are dangerous chemicals, so they are corrosive. They need storing away from equipment, particularly laptops, I would remind my staff, and uh, they need storing in a, a secondary sealed container uh, would be ideal uh, when you're traveling out and about on the road. So that if it goes over in your van, uh, it's held within a, a, sec a secondary container. But uh, it, it is important, but it, it's the one thing that we've done well for, for many, many years. I'll just briefly talk about the importance of scanning within breeding programmes so that we're all clear as to, to why we do this and, and the benefits that can be derived from ultrasound scanning. We know that the value of genetic improvement to the sheep industry is worth the best part of £10 million per annum because of the cumulative and permanent way that we can actually lift productivity of sheep. Here's a nice chart for Charolais showing the progress they've made in terms of growth rate um, over the last, I don't know what have we got here, 30 years or so. Uh, massive lifts in, in uh, genetic potential for growth. And here's the potential in terms of weight adjusted muscle and fat depth. So you can see in the late 80s, before we really had ultrasound scanning, we weren't making major changes to the muscle and fat levels. We were just getting the animals to grow faster. Widespread use of ultrasound quickly enabled us to select leaner genetics uh, and led to an improvements in muscling. Over time, we became a bit less interested in the very lean genetics, but interest in muscle and yield has only increased over time and actually in many ways breeders have selected to put more emphasis on muscling relative to growth so that we have that well-balanced high confirmation animal that, that gets away fast. So you can really see the benefit here of the use of ultrasound in refining those breeding decisions. And actually in recent years it's not about making them leaner but it is about making them more muscly, muscly muscular at a fixed weight. Um, breeders will be very interested in raw data, you know, very excited if they get a 36, 37 mil eye muscle. Um, inevitably that's going to be from a single male 
one of the oldest in the group and might be out of the show team. It's important not to use raw data in isolation, but as with any other raw measurement, to get it analysed to take out those non-genetic effects and to use the estimated breeding values to make those selection decisions. You still hope that 36, 37 mil eye muscle lamb has a very, very good muscle depth EBV, but there might be some other good ones in there with slightly lower measurements on the day with equally good genetic merit. So important to get the breeders to focus on the EBVs. Um, how signet analyses changed over time? Well, the big change we made a couple of years ago is moving from age adjusted breeding values for muscle and fat depth to weight adjusted. So it's less now about how muscly will they be at 20 weeks of age and how fat or lean will they be at 20 weeks in age, but it's how much muscle, how much fat do they have on them at a fixed weight. Because at the end of the day, we're tending to kill lambs, not on their birthdays, but when they reach slaughter weight. And that's when we want to know how much muscle and how much fat do they have on them. So it changes the questions that you will get as technicians about when to scan from, you know, what age? And the answer is, well, how big are the lambs? We want the majority of the lambs to be sort of 35 kilos. Certainly in our terminal siren and, and lowland breeds, I realised for hill lambs, that's going to be more of a challenge. Um, but, you know, we need them to have a reasonable weight. We need them to have a reasonable amount of uh, fat cover as well. You need some fat to have been laid down by the time we come out to, to scan. The new trait definition is more heritable. So in theory, we could make faster progress because more of the variation in sheep that we've analysed is due to their genetics. However, it tends to be a bit less variable than when we express EBVs on an age adjusted basis. The other thing that's interesting to note is that uh, on, an, on a weight adjusted basis, there can be a bit of a negative correlation between muscle and fat traits. If we put more muscle into the carcass and we don't change the weight, then inevitably there must be something less there. And so fat has the potential to reduce over time. And actually we create breeding indexes uh, to try and avoid big changes in that respect. For those that are interested, our guidelines were updated as we moved to, to weight adjusted traits. This means that flocks, particularly where lambs are, are particularly well grown, can scan a bit earlier. We can measure lambs closer to slaughter weight and it means the sheep that we're measuring more closely reflect modern breeding objectives. And there's lots more information about that up on the Signet website for those that are interested. You can drop me an email. Um, probably useful to explain it does work. Uh, this is a nice example from the ram compare progeny test uh, that we run. This is a couple of Charolais rams here, near identical breeding values for scan weight, but very different breeding values for muscle depth. You can see the arrow here pointing to the muscle depth breeding value on, on the chart. And the impact of that was a big difference in terms of the distribution of, of carcass conformation in the lambs that, that were killed. So. Muscle depth doesn't entirely explain conformation. It, there's a correlation with jigot shape, but they're not one and the same. However, we do know that we can use uh, the ultrasound uh, scanning to improve uh, muscling in the carcass in general. And, and this is a nice example. I'll just briefly touch on the CT scanner, uh, which some of you will have heard about. So ultrasound scanning's great. We can do 30, 40,000 lambs a year. Uh, very quickly and relatively cost effectively on farms up and down the country. But the icing on the cake is to put lambs through the CT scanner and terminal sire breeders will do this to get that extra information to go into our genetic evaluations. So at the CT unit, they will measure the total lean, total fat and total bone weight within the live lamb. Uh, you can also look at spinal length and vertebrae number. And we can also look at the intramuscular fat, which I talked about earlier. Interestingly, they will also measure muscle depth, width and area. So for those technicians out there, you've actually got a, a second measurement being taken uh, that we can use to, to calibrate against your measurements. But what I would say is there's a very good correlation between the two at a genetic level, which shows that we've been doing a pretty good job of ultrasound uh, all these uh, many decades.
So that's a little bit about the CT unit. The beauty there is that you can ultrasound several hundred lambs you'll only ever be able to send let's say five or ten of your very best through unless you've got lots and lots of money uh, through the, the CT unit. So use ultrasound to find those elite animals to go through the CT unit. Um, it's worth pointing out that they do measure at a slightly different point on the spine when they look at depth and width and area. So the ranking of animals uh, you can compare but it isn't one and the same measurement if you actually look at the uh, depth measurements they pick up the CT scanner they'll tend to be um, a bigger measurement doesn't matter from a blood point of view but it's important when people talk to you about muscle depth you know whether it's an ultrasound or a CT muscle depth um, and these CT measurements will influence the breeding values for the on-farm traits and the on-farm traits will influence the breeding values that we produce for the CT measurement so there's there's quite a, a nice correlation there and finally, when they talk about area, we've traced it round here in red. It's perhaps just useful to point out, it's not just talking about the one single longissimus dorsi muscle. It's also picking up another of those, a couple of those other small muscles that are in that region. Essentially, it's all the muscle within that loin area, not just that one individual muscle. So where to find information? If you head to the Signet website, um, breeders would be able to find all of their raw data and breeding values and we also put quite a bit of technical information up there uh, about ultrasound scanning. You'll see the deadline dates are shown there for when data needs to come in so that might help when you're making appointments um, and you'll have the contact details for Signet as well should you need them. Clients can see a number of things on the website. Everybody can view EBVs for individual sheep. They can see lists of the top ram lambs, shearlings and stock rams. We've got a flock finder that will show them breeders in their region. And there's also a sheep for sale section uh, where information is published. For individual clients that are logged on, they can produce flock reports. They can actually produce their scanning report once the data has come in and been uploaded. Uh, and they can also see a bit of raw data as well as information that enables them to enter data online, produce flock trends, uh, produce uh, inbreeding runs for their flock and even some index customization tools for those that might want to put even more selection pressure on muscle depth. So that's it for this presentation. Uh, I want to give an acknowledgement and a thank you to all the technicians that I've worked with over the years and particularly those that have helped to pull this presentation together. This is version one and uh, if you've listened to it and there are areas that you think we can change or update or where more clarity is required, please do send me an email to Sam Boone, uh, Samuel Boone down at Signet and uh, I suspect that uh, version 2 won't be very far behind. Thank you very much. <laughs>